Hi there, everybody. <sighs> About 50 years ago, uh, Edsger Dijkstra, in his Turing Award lecture, told us that we should be paying attention to intellectual control. Because it's really hard to understand what your program is going to do when you run it. You'd like to be able to look at it and have some confidence that it's going to do what you expect. Now, I don't have any code from 50 years ago that I can easily show you. And if I did, it probably would be on punch cards. But what I can do is talk to you about 25 years ago, when I started programming. Surprisingly, it was pretty similar to what you're doing today. Uh, I happen to be working in Smalltalk. Uh, you may not remember this, but Smalltalk has lambdas in it, and it has data flow operators. So while Java just got the ability to do map and reduce and filtering on collections a couple years ago, this has been in lots of programming languages for a long time. If you were to look at me at my desk, I'd be sitting there in front of a Solaris workstation with Windows, and the only thing that would look different is that the title bars are a little old-fashioned, but otherwise completely familiar to you. We also did object-oriented analysis, design and programming, which is what a lot of you are also doing today. Maybe less analysis and design, but certainly the programming. And something that we were a bit ahead of the curve on is we were doing delivery every two weeks, OK? Pretty good. We were getting code in production, no big disasters. The thing that's a bit interesting is that 25 years ago, very few people were doing testing ubiquitously. If I had to have you guys raise your hands, I think that almost everybody would say, we all have regression test suites today, and that's why we feel safe to push our code into production, because the tests all went green. So this should be surprising to us. Like, How is it possible this team was able to regularly get code into production and not pull their hair out and worry about it all the time? What was going on is that we were following some of the advice of Edsker Dijkstra, and not just us, but everybody else. We structured our code in such a way that it was more amenable to thinking through it and having confidence in what it was doing. Now, we definitely would run the program, and we would click on the UI and make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. But that kind of testing, that manual testing, was a double check to make sure that our reasoning was right, rather than the primary kind of confidence that we got. If I think about what I do today, um, I have a big, wide, snuggly blanket of tests covering my code. And I get an enormous amount of confidence from the fact that those things are there, and they make sure that the code that was working yesterday also works tomorrow. As I add new code, it hasn't broken anything, OK? Now, the idea of still doing reasoning along with that testing is 100% compatible. But I find that not as many people do it, especially um, uh, teams that, are, uh, that were not uh, exposed to these ideas 25 years ago, say. And there's something that's a bit worrying to me. And I've done this, and I've seen other people do it. I call it whack-a-mole development. Maybe you've done it too. It goes something like this. You write some code, but you don't really fully understand everything, but you're trying to get everything done. So you write this code, and a test breaks. And you're like, oh, OK, well, let me go over to fix that and understand a little bit more. You fix that test. Oh, well, something else broke. OK, another test broke. OK, fix that. Great, everything's looking pretty good. Oh, the end-to-end -end tests are broken. OK, you go fix that, and you're off to the races. At that point, the tests are green, but I feel worried that actually everything is OK, because by definition, we can't test everything. The tests are a representative sample of the things that are going on, right? So when I engage in that kind of whack-a-mole behavior where I realize I don't have full understanding of what's going on, maybe I'm leaning on the wrong thing. And I was re leaning on tests when I should have been le leaning on reasoning. So I need to introduce that vocabulary of intellectual control here. The idea with intellectual control, as Dijkstra was talking about it, is before you run the code, do you have good confidence it's going to do what you expect? Now, Dijkstra was a mathematician by training, and so he held the standard to say, we should be proving our code to be correct. Very few of us do that today, although if you are in your IDE and it says this variable might be null and it looks like you're dereferencing it, believe it or not, that's actually the same proof infrastructure that's demonstrating that that's going on. But he introduced this idea of structured programming, probably most famous for the fact that you no longer have go-to statements in your code. 
But the idea was far bigger than this. It was that we can structure our code in such a way that makes it easy or harder to reason through it and have confidence in what it does. So really beyond the proofs, there's all kinds of things that we do today or don't do today that can give us more or less confidence. I would include things like having a really strong type system instead of being stringly typed, if you're familiar with that. Uh, structuring your code so it has consistency, using abstract data types, uh, designed by contract, and so forth. So let me contrast intellectual control with statistical control. Now, with statistical control, you run the code once or many times, and because you run it in representative cases, you give yourself confidence. Yeah, I ran it. It does what I expect it to do, okay? So, uh, with these two things, I think you can see these are two different ways of getting to the same answer, which is, you know, I, I'm building code that does what I expect. And because uh, you guys have been kind enough to all come here, I feel like I should say something a bit radical and a bit edgy that disturbs you. So, so here it is. I worry that our reliance on testing has numbed us to the fact that we're doing less reasoning than we used to, and that there's some danger in this. I'm going to spend the rest of the talk building up to this so that you don't think it's quite as radical and crazy as, you, as it might first seem. Projects don't start out out of control. They start out in control. We have intellectual control and statistical control. Uh, in these slides, I'm using IC and SC because it uh, otherwise is big and noisy. So what I'm showing here with one box, let's say that that's one chunk of code, one module, and that's at the beginning of the project, and I've got both intellectual and statistical control. Now, things never, start, or things never uh, stay so simple. So here's an example where we've got two modules, okay? And the first module is working with the second module. Again, everything is small. I've got it all under control. And notice that there's a, a containing box. And what I mean by that is that's the system as, as a whole, okay? And with that system, again, I have both intellectual and statistical control. Again, nothing stays so simple. Uh, so on this slide, I'm going to show four modules, but it could be 40 or 400 or 4,000, okay? The point is you have a bunch of code and things are interacting with each other. What I'm showing here is the first thing that you, you, you usually lose intellectual control of is the big assembly. Just because the state space is so large, it's hard to have confidence that everything's working, okay? So while things were small, you could think through it. As things get really big, you end up leaning on your end-to-end -end test to make sure that things are really working. But it gets worse. Uh, invariably, schedule pressure or some engineer that didn't quite understand what's going on gets in there and starts hacking some module, and you sort of lose your clear understanding of what's going on inside there. And so it, it reverts, so it's only got statistical control. The tests make sure it continues to work, but if you had to describe it, you'd have a really hard time. The problem I've noticed is that it's kind of infectious. And once one module, you can't have a clear uh, description of what's going on, the modules around it tend to lose their clear descriptions, right? It's, it's just doing it because it's supposed to do it that way. And it did it that way yesterday, and we can make sure it does it tomorrow. So in this way, you can see that we, uh, on our projects, we drift towards using statistical control more than we use uh, the intellectual control. I would imagine many of you are wondering at this point, gee, George, what about refactoring? Doesn't refactoring solve all known problems? And the answer is, I love refactoring. I do refactoring all the time, okay? But we must remember what the definition of refactoring is. The definition of refactoring is that it's a behavior-preserving transformation of the code, right? Okay? So if, something, if somebody's come into some module that was coherent and made sense and adds a bunch of if statements that no longer make sense, refactoring can't change those requirements, right? Refactoring can just restructure the code so that it is clearer to understand. If we need to go in and, say, simplify the requirements or renegotiate interfaces between modules, that's not refactoring, that's redesign. And the problem with redesign, if you've ever gone into existing code, you can understand all the code, but you may not understand why it does it. So you're forced into this problem of having to rediscover the program requirements, which have become murky and lost over time before you can redesign it. But I think the most 
compelling argument here is for about 20 years, uh, there's been a rallying cry that says, uh, go forth, don't really worry, no one says don't worry about intellectual control, but in many ways, projects have gone forth uh, without leaning on intellectual control, and they were hoping that refactoring would save them. I would say we would see lots of success stories if that were true, but I think we instead see lots of teams grappling with technical debt. So the problem with this shift towards statistical control, which usually happens without anybody saying, I think that's a good idea, it just sort of happens on projects, is that once you go down that path, it's very difficult to reverse course and come back. If you ask any gardener how much weeding you should do and when you should do it, their answer is always the same. It's like, stay on top of the weeding because once the weeds take over, it's really tough, okay? But remember, if you've got two weeds or one weed, it's only twice as hard to do two weeds as one weed, okay? It's linear. When complexity takes over your project, it's a super linear problem, right? You know, two modules of complexity is way worse. 10 modules is way more than 10 times as hard, okay? Because everything is a big nest of trouble. So what I've noticed is once a project loses its intellectual control, very few teams have either the money or the time or the you know, opportunity in the market to come back and recover the control over the software. They have to just keep it running and they continue to use the testing. So what was it that we were able to do 25 years ago? I mean, what was magic about keeping intellectual control then? What I found is that simply wrestling with the program and trying to keep intellectual control has the effect of pushing down on complexity. I don't have time to like do a rigorous demonstration to you guys this is true, and I'm not sure I could do one, but, but here's sort of my intuition that leads me to this conclusion. The first thing is that complexity builds up over time on projects. We get new requirements in, the bureaucracy, uh, you know, uh, regulations and so forth. Nothing really makes any sense, we just have to accommodate it. The second thing is our minds are limited. Like, we are pretty smart, like our, our profession attracts people that are pretty good at problem solving, but we all recognize we have limits. There's only so much we can keep in there. The third thing is that for any given problem, you've got a bunch of different ways you could solve it, okay? And some of those things are more complicated than others. It may take you longer to find the simpler ones or to cast your problem in terms of the simpler solutions, but they're out there a lot of times. So what I find is that doing this daily uh, search uh, for simpler solutions because you're trying to keep the code inside of your head overall has the effect of keeping complexity down. So let's go back to that big, seemingly contentious statement before, which is that our reliance, our leaning heavily on testing in the last 25 years, which has been undeniably a good thing, again, is perhaps blinding us or numbing us to the alarm bells that would otherwise be ringing that say that we're not keeping the, the software under as much intellectual control as we did. Said another way, statistical control that we've been using is numbing us to our loss of intellectual control. Here's a notional diagram of what I see happening in projects. <laughs> so a friend of mine recently, uh, he's in a startup, and he, and he tells me about how this thing is going on for several years, and then like all of a sudden, uh, the software team is making no progress, and when he goes in there and starts chatting with the folks, he finds out the complexity is built up to the point where these guys are not making any forward progress, right? That's, that's been the problem. And so if you were to graph the amount of control this team had over time, I think it might look something like this. Early on, everything fit in their heads. They were following practices that were not necessarily what you would consider best practice, but they were good enough and they were making progress and they're out there making money. At some point, they shifted and they shifted into the point where they really lost intellectual control. And that's why I call this zombies, in the sense that their control only seemed to go down a little bit, but realistically, they were now in a dead end of a project that they couldn't easily back out of, okay? And so, in some ways, you might believe there's going to be that collapse of productivity uh, once, once people get to the, uh, their brains get full. It just hasn't happened yet. So, we're here at a software architecture conference, so let's chat about how specifically this, this works with uh, software architecture. 
To start with, let's consider just a single module, like a, a class file or a, 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 another kind of unit of, of code. I think that both statistical control and intellectual control work great in this particular case. You can blanket it with tests, and you know it's small enough that that works pretty well. I could read the test, or maybe I can even write the test in such a way that I understand the code pretty well. But I can also use intellectual control. Um, there's a great bag of software engineering techniques that include abstract data types, information hiding, structuring things as state machines that help me in my ability to reason through that code. So I think all of those work really well for a single module. How about for your entire system? It's different for the entire system. Here's the argument I'm going to make. Uh, I think all of you guys would agree if you look at your current project and you count the number of unit tests versus the number of end-to-end -end tests. There's something like 100 to 1, maybe 1,000 to 1, maybe even more of a ratio of the number of end-to-end -end tests you have versus unit tests. Is that because the state space of your individual modules is so much larger than the state space of the entire program? Well, of course not. That doesn't make any sense. You know, by definition, the state space of the whole program is, is big. So then why aren't we dumping tests on it? Because it's hard. You know, like these things take a long time to run. They take a long time to write. They're finicky. They're often flaky. So I think what really is going on with software architecture, and the reason you guys are here today, is that we have traditionally, in our field of software architecture, used intellectual control to keep things on track. We're here in Manhattan, which has a grid plan, right? Grid plan was an architectural decision made early on that is reaping pros and cons as, we, uh, as we're here today. So when you set up an architecture, you might say, I have these views of the problem. I'm going to apply certain standard styles to it. I understand that I'm going to promote latency, and I'm going to you know, get hurt in some other way. And I might do some hoisting to enforce some of these constraints. So, what can we do? Um, obviously, uh, what I suggest is you should delete all your tests. Just delete them all right now and go. <laughs> no, before Twitter lights up. Uh, what I'd suggest is what we really want is both, OK? But the, the real question here is, how can we keep that intellectual control that we start with, how can we keep it going? The first thing to do is culture, right? If we start having this conversation, if you use this vocabulary of intellectual control and talking about what structured programming was really all about, you can perhaps get everybody on board and try to keep this going. Failing that, the answer is more testing, but of a different type. Property-based testing and model-based testing let you state what your abstractions are in your tests and make sure that they stay there. The reason that's interesting is that there's a strong cultural bias against deleting somebody else's tests, right? So if you go into a module that has property-based testing or model-based testing and you need to extend it, you're kind of on the hook to extend that that those tests to work in that same way. If you look at your project and you suspect that you actually have low amounts of intellectual control, I suggest asking the two questions. First, what about your process is driving you towards intellectual control? If the answer is, well, we're being driven to make sure it passes the style guide and make sure it has good test coverage and that we deliver on time, but there's no nothing about the process that uh, encourages intellectual control, that's the first place to look. The second thing is companies can accidentally reward people that create complexity and make it hard to reason, and, and unfortunately discourage people who collapse that back down. Like We all want to make it nice and simple, but sometimes the incentives in the company don't work that way. So overall, thank you guys very much for listening to this talk. Um, this is kind of a, uh, an abstract topic to be talking about early in the morning. What we've been chatting about here is the way that we keep control over large amounts of software, which is an inherent problem with software architecture. In the old days, before we all uh, decided that testing was cool, we had to structure the code in such a way that it was easy to think through. Okay? Today, we have that opportunity along with our test. And what we're really shooting for is something like a nice balance of reasoning and testing. I've written a couple papers on this uh, on my website uh, that spell out some of these things in a bit more detail. Uh, feel free to check those out. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>